So I want to talk about what I think could be a nice application of Bitcoin's proof of work security to achieve um, an improvement of improvement in security in the way that we um, kind of rely on software updates and software distribution dependency uh, infrastructure on the internet. And um, what I'm talking about here is something called binary transparency. So what is binary transparency? So let's suppose that you have a Android phone or iPhone and you go and download a piece of software from the App Store or, or Google Play. How do you know, for example, that that APK or that piece of software that you're being given is the same, pe is the same piece of software that is, given, is, give, is being given to everyone else and Google or Apple hasn't specifically given you a backdoored version of that software because they were uh, threatened to do so or were compelled to do so in a court order, for example, or because their code signing keys were compromised. And this is a real problem because um, that has happened before. Because, for example, in 2012, um, there was a piece of malware developed by the NSA called Flame that actually used a rogue Microsoft signing certificate to spread the malware by infecting users via Windows Update. And obviously, Microsoft never, didn't know that because they didn't know what was being signed with the certificates because they didn't have a, there was no transparency there. And then in 2015, uh, there was obviously the famous case where um, the FBI wanted to unlock an iPhone or decrypt an iPhone of a suspected terrorist. So the FBI got a court order against Apple um, to make them sign a backdoored version of iOS that they could actually put onto the iPhone that would bypass the um, passcode limiting, rate limiting um, features so that the FBI could make thousands of guesses per second to decrypt that person's iPhone. So how does binary transparency, um, so binary transparency is not to be confused with reproducible bills. So the problem that reproducible bills are trying to solve is how, given a piece of, given a binary, how do you know that that binary uh, was compiled from a specific source code? But the, the problem that binary transparency is, is trying to solve is how do you know that the binary that you're being given is the same binary that everyone else is being given? And if it's not the same binary, then, then you at least want to have some assurances that that binary is public so that everyone knows about that binary. So that if, for example, Apple wanted to give you a backdoored version of that binary because they were compelled by the FBI, then that would be transparent and everyone would know about it. So they wouldn't be able to do that in secret. So to understand why this is a good use case for, for, for with Bitcoin's proof of work, and this is not just something that you can just use a basic Merkle tree for like certificate transparency, for example. Um, I'm gonna talk a little bit about what a basic model of transparency might look like. So people have been suggesting to use Merkle trees for things, for things called verifiable logs since the 90s, um, which, which, which would typically consist of, you would obviously have a log, an append-only log that is basically a Merkle tree or a hash chain, and some company like, or that wants to be audited would write to that log its actions, i.e. the auditee, and then the, the end user that wants to audit the log and to make sure things are in, certain things are in the log would read that log or get a Merkle proof of inclusion of certain things being in that log. And systems like these have been proposed for almost two decades now, uh, just using simple Merkle trees. But the obvious problem that you would have is um, what happens if, you're, if, you're being, if the log is forked and the person who's responsible for maintaining that log or ledger um, gives, you, gives, gives different people a different version of that log with different things inside of it. So in, in, again, with the use case or the example of Apple versus the FBI, what if Apple just forked, forked their, their log and put a backdoor update in that log and gave it to someone else and they wouldn't be able to know that that log was the same log that was being given to everyone else. So that's, that's equivocation. And we all know how Bitcoin deals with this using proof of work to make sure that um, there's consensus on what the actual correct blockchain or ledger or log is. But there's two ways of dealing with this. Um, so there's what, I would call, what we would call retroactive transparency, 
which is what certificate transparency does, and proactive transparency, which is what systems like Bitcoin do. So for those of you that haven't heard of certificate transparency, certificate transparency um, is a system created by Google for, for use in Chrome that is designed to make um, to, to deal with the problem of certificate authorities signing rogue certificates. And so now, um, if you want to have a SSL certificate accepted by Google Chrome as valid, then your certificate authority would have to make sure that they submit every certificate to Google's log server that uses um, a Merkle tree, a append only Merkle tree, so that every single certificate ever um, signed by a certificate authority is actually transparent and everyone knows about it. So if some certificate authority signed some rogue certificate for google.com or any other website, everyone, everyone is supposed to know about it. But the way that systems like certificate transparency will deal with this problem is through a mechanism called gossiping. So obviously certificate transparency isn't using proof of work or any kind of, cons any kind of consensus mechanism. It's just using a centralized log server or a ledger um, created by Google and also some other companies and certificate authorities. So there's, there's multiple log servers. But the way that they deal with the case where a log server might fork the log and give people different views of the log is through a mechanism called gossiping. So auditors would basically gossip to each other or talk to each other about the, um, the Merkle routes for the logs that they have, that have, they have been receiving. And then if they compare it with each other or they, send, or they gossip with each other and they realize that the log server was being dishonest and giving people different views of the log, then that would be detectable and the log server would be detected as malicious. But the key thing to recognize here is that this doesn't actually prevent logs um, from being, from being this, doesn't, this doesn't actually prevent log equivocation. So it still lets the log server do it, but it just simply makes it possible to detect it. And um, so like a lot of people say, well, if you just want transparency, you just use specific transparency. Uh, you, don't need to use, you don't need to use a blockchain. But I don't think it's as simple as that because for, for um, certificate transparency like systems to be useful, you need, at the end of the day, you still need a way to not rely or not, not to trust the log server. And at the moment, gossiping um, isn't, really, isn't very practical and hasn't been implemented yet because of privacy and performance issues. So like in Google Chrome right now, um, it's, it's supposed to be checking for inclusion proofs, but it doesn't do that. And gossiping hasn't been implemented. So right now, Google's log servers are completely trusted. And in the context of binary transparency, um, gossiping and retroactive transparency is specifically unsuitable because if you're trying to, let's suppose, update a binary that has root access, which are the most in important binaries to keep transparent, then that binary could easily disable the gossiping mechanism after you, after you execute that binary. And once you disable that gossiping mechanism on your device, then fraud from the log server or misbehavior from the log server would, not be, would never be found out. And also, it's specifically unsuitable for devices that, can, that have a low level of resources or low amount of resources or can easily be um, eclipse attacks. And they can be, to be, to be prevented from actually gossiping to other nodes in the first place. Um, so, and then there's the other way of doing it, which is proact proactive transparency. Now, the idea of proactive transparency is to make equivocation difficult to do in the first place, and not, instead of just making it simply detectable, like certificate transparency does. A basic way of doing that might be, for example, just to use a threshold signature scheme or just use a consensus mechanism so that um, a bunch of people have to sign every single um, updated log or every single new Merkle route to the log. But this, does, this still doesn't answer the problem of how do, you have, how do you select those people in a civil resistant way. Like you still need a governance process, which is something that ideally I would imagine most people here would, try to, would want to avoid. Um, so obviously the way that Bitcoin achieves this is, is through using uh, crypto economic incentives. Um, because if you wanted to actually 
create two different views of the, of the blockchain, then you, it would be quite expensive to do so. You would have to either do a 51% attack or you would have to do an eclipse attack, which is which I'll talk about um, later on. So let's suppose that we've actually wanted to build a system that can achieve binary transparency on using the Bitcoin blockchain or any kind of proof of work based blockchain. Um, so let's look at some of the actors in the system uh, so that, and the threat model. So first of all, you have services. And by services, I just basically mean um, application developers that actually provide applications to the end user. Um, so they actually create an issue to software and they might submit it to somewhere like the Google Play Store or Debian or Linux software reposit repositories, um, which would be the authority. So the authority in this in this threat model would basically basically be um, the party that's responsible for authenticating or approving that software, i.e. the App Store or Google Play or the, or the Linux software repositories and actually distribute that uh, software to you. Um, and then you have the monitor, which would basically be responsible for inspecting updates in that log to see if there might be something fishy there. For example, if you, if you monitor the log and you see some binary there or the hash of some binary there that no one has been, that hasn't actually been distributed anywhere to anyone, so it might look like an obvious um, targeted backdoor. And then you have auditors, which are basically responsible for checking that binaries, that certain binaries in the log on behalf of users that actually want to install these updates. Now in practice, the auditor and the user would be the same party. So by auditor, I, I would just mean a piece of software that is on the user's computer. So in practice, they're effectively, effectively the same actor. So in, under this threat model, you would assume that the authority is completely untrusted and could be compromised at any point. So their, their code signing keys, for example, might be compromised, or for, or for example, they might be um, legally compelled to sign something. And also, the auditor and the user may be compromised after acting upon a certain log entry, i.e. after verifying that some update is in the log and then installing the update and then having his gossiping mechanism disabled. And also the auditor's or user's local network is not trusted. So what that, what that means is that um, you have no idea, you can't make any assumptions about the Bitcoin nodes that you're actually communicating to because, because they all might be malicious and they might be hiding from you the actual blocks that are being distributed to the rest of the network and they might be doing something called an, an, an eclipse attack where they might be feeding you only specific blocks that might have less accumulated proof of work than blocks in the rest of the network, i.e. To, to try to hide certain information from you or hide certain transactions from you. Um, now, under this threat model, we will assume that the authority has some known Bitcoin address that can be associated with this code signing certificate. And this, this Bitcoin address would act as basically like a like the root of trust for that specific authority. How that address is actually distributed is out of scope. It can just be like hard coded in the software or it can be you can use some kind of public key infrastructure, but it doesn't really matter. So what so what would what might the um, workflow look like? So first of all, the service could send a binary to the authority to try to get it up approved in some kind of app store um, or software repository. And then the authority would somehow commit um, to, that, to those binaries or a batch of binaries on the Bitcoin blockchain. Now in practice, what, would, what this would look like would simply be um, they could publish transactions that contain a Merkle root of a batch of uh, updates or a batch of binaries um, that they want to commit to and they can simply include that in, for example, the op return field of a transaction or whatever is your favorite way to include arbitrary data in Bitcoin transactions. And so, and then let's, pay, let's suppose in step three, um, the client now wants to install the software update distributed by the authority. So the authority would send them the, the actual binary, but they would also send them a proof of inclusion 
that that binary was actually committed to in the Bitcoin blockchain. Um, and then the client or the auditor would actually check or validate that inclusion proof because the auditor would have to run an SPV client that would get all, that would download all the block headers from the Bitcoin blockchain to be able to actually verify these inclusion proofs. Then um, you also have the monitor, which is responsible for actually monitoring the log to see if there's anything fishy in there. And um, the monitor would simply inspect or, mo or monitor the Bitcoin blockchain for any transactions that ha have been assigned by the authority's uh, Bitcoin address, and then monitor the binary batch Merkle root there to, to see what, what has been committed there. And then it could do, for example, actually inspect the binary data there to see if there's anything interesting there. Or if, for example, so, or if, or if, for example there's a binary there that no one knows about or hasn't actually been distributed. Um, so there's also a, there's an interesting um, problem here, which actually is pretty similar to the problem about censorship resistance that Peter was talking about in the previous talk, was is about, um, well, what if the... Um, what if the authority publishes or commits to a Merkle root of binary of binaries, but doesn't actually publish the data behind those in those in those leaves? It doesn't actually publish the binaries themselves. So then you would just see a, a hash on the on, a, on, on the Bitcoin blockchain, but it would you wouldn't actually know what that hash corresponds to. Now you was, that would still be detectable as misbehavior, because if no if you ask around and no one has a copy of these binaries, so there's this, there's just this hash on the Bitcoin blockchain, but no one has, no one actually has a copy of these binaries because they weren't distributing them on their website or via the App Store. Then it would it would become clear from a social perspective that something fishy is going on. Now it's important to note that none of this, when I say something fishy is going on, none of this, this is all quite social. So like it doesn't, there is no systematic way or technical way to actually say well there's a malicious binary in here. This is effectively a way to, to socially audit um, the authority. Um, so what if you actually want, however, to force the authority or to have some assurance that the authority is publishing um, Merkle roots for binaries and is also actually publishing the actual data for those binaries? Because if you are downloading an update from the App Store, that is a targeted backdoor for you, then it would be nice to have some assurance that if you're downloading, downloading the update, then the binary of the update is actually um, known to everyone so that if it did turn out to be malicious, then you could actually inspect that binary to see what, it, what exactly was malicious about it. Um, the, as Peter said, there's no, easy, there's no easy solution to that um, unless you actually do something stupid like publish the actual binaries themselves to the Bitcoin blockchain. But um, in the context of the Linux repositories, um, I think there's kind of like a natural solution here because with the Linux repositories, for example, Debian repositories, there's loads of mirrors around the world. So if you can use them, or if you assume that those mirrors um, are a set of Sybil resistance or, or a set of nodes that don't have a Sybil in them, then you could basically do some kind of threshold scheme where, you, where the auditor could ask a bunch of these mirrors to say, hey, do you have the data for this? And if they say yes, then they would accept that they would accept the inclusion proofs for those updates. But if they say no, then they would reject those updates. So then, they would, so then the workflow would look like something like this. So after the auditor verifies the inclusion proof, they would have to um, what I, what said, let's do step 10, which is um, says get arc state, which is basically getting the state of the archive, archival node, which is basically responsible for downloading all of the data from the authority and making sure that it actually exists. So the auditor can simply, so the archival nodes can simply tell the auditors the latest block hash that they have that they have verified that up to this block hash, they have downloaded all of the data for that specific authority that, which, which has committed to the specific binaries. 
so let's look at this um, from an economic security perspective. So what would it cost to actually attack a system like this? So if your network isn't malicious, so if your device has, a, so if the local network that your device is connected to um, isn't malicious and you can actually connect to real Bitcoin nodes that are connected to the rest of the network, then you would basically have to do a 51% attack in order to reverse um, certain transactions that you don't want or in order to equivocate the chain. And that's obviously prohibitively expensive. Um, if you assume that you're using Antminer S9s at the retail price, it would cost $2 billion in hardware. And in electricity, it would cost about $100,000 um, per hour, assuming that electricity isn't free and actually costs 10 cents per kilowatt hour. So obviously these are big assumptions, but that's, kind of, that's the kind of order of magnitude, I suppose, that you would expect. Now, if you can do an eclipse attack, it gets more interesting. Because let's suppose um, in the case of Apple versus the FBI, um, the FBI basically had this, this person's iPhone, um, iPhone in their office, or they were holding it in a police, police station or whatnot. And so they obviously had control over that iPhone's local network. So in that case, it would be easier to actually equivocate the log because the attacker would be able to actually um, equivocate the log or produce blocks at their own pace because they're not competing with the rest of the network. They're only competing with themselves. So they have unlimited time to actually create these blocks. So if you wanted to do the attack within a week, um, and let's say, let's suppose the auditors, the auditor on the phone requires at least six confirmations before they accept um, a binary as valid, then it would cost about $8 million in hardware cost and about $100,000 um, in electricity. But the key thing to realize is that you have to do this attack for every single block header. So like if you have, if you have 10 devices in the police station, for example, and their latest synchronized state is such that they all have a, a different block header as their latest state, um, then you would basically have to do that attack 10 times, assuming that those block headers are about six, six blocks apart. So in terms of performance, it's pretty much what we would expect from an SPV client. So it's not really too interesting. Um, auditors have to download about the same amount of data that you would need for an SPV client, which is about 37 megabytes in terms of how much block headers you have to download. And, um, and also authorities obviously have to run a, run a Bitcoin full node. So I actually kind of prototyped to see what this would look like if you were to actually implement this in the Debian um, software repositories. Because um, like if you wanted to right now, you could actually modify the APT software or, apt or aptitude and make it perform these checks. And you wouldn't have to ask for permission from Debian that you could actually implement this today without asking for, for permission from, from anyone. Um, so as of January 2017, um, there was about 1.7 terabytes of binaries in Debian software repositories. And there was about 1,000 package updates a day. About, and these 1,000 package updates a day uh, were split into batches of four that happened four times a day. So that means you have to do about four Bitcoin transactions a day, which is pretty, which is which is, which seems pretty reasonable. Um, in terms of overhead costs, you would obviously have to download the inclusion proofs. Each every single time you have to, you download a piece of software, uh, or you do like apps install something, you would have to download the inclusion proof for every single piece of software, and that inclusion proof would be about one point three kilobytes because that's also including the block header of each block. Because um, under this model, the users would have to run SPV clients, but once they actually download the block headers, they don't have to store the block headers themselves. They only have to store the hashes of those block headers. They can get a Merkle proof that each hash is associated to a specific block header. And that would cost about 11 kilobytes a day or five kilobytes a day for storage, which seems pretty reasonable to me. Um, if you want to check out the prototype, you can check it out. Check it out on this GitHub link. Um, does anyone have any questions?
Hi. Um, could you could you um, distribute that work? So there's 1.4 terabytes or whatever it was. Could you say, okay, we'll just have like 500 people run nodes and they pick a random chunk of it and somehow yeah. divide the work? Um, so I'm guessing you mean distribute it in terms of who provides the proofs? Oh, okay. Um, I suppose you could. Yeah, I think you could distribute it because you could basically say that okay, every all the software that begins with the letter A to let's say G or something, or or you could just hash it and say modulus four or something. Let's let's suppose you want to split it across five people. You could just say okay, this the first one in five software ha is distributed to this authority, and uh, so you can distribute it to five different authorities that would have to create five different um, Bitcoin transactions every single time there was, a, there was a batched update to the repository. So I think you could actually distribute it. Am I correct in saying that you said that in the case of you know multiple say iPhones in the evidence locker, the FBI would have to go and recreate blocks for each different phone? Because I don't think that's correct. So I, I didn't. So I said for each different phone that has a different block header, assuming that those block headers are six blocks apart, if you wanted to have um, six confirmations on average. So why would them? Sorry. Why wouldn't they just feed them blocks up to one point, so they're all at a common point, then go create the fake blocks? Yeah, that's a good point. Um, yeah, I suppose they could do that. Let me think about that. Thanks. There's a question at the back over there. Um, yeah, to to uh, expand on uh, the uh, the FBI uh, case, um, is it correct also that the uh, the uh, hardware cost is uh, pretty much reusable uh, across different uh, uh, attacks uh, or attack batches? Yeah, of course. Yeah, of course. So once you actually have all the hardware that you need, then you can attack all the devices that you need. Assuming that you have, assuming that you can pay for the electricity, but I do. Th so yeah, I mean, I said um, back here that it would cost about eight million dollars in hardware if you had to do the attack within a week. Which seems, which I think the FBI would probably be willing to spend that that kind of money, but you could significantly increase that cost if you force them to do the attack within um, a lower period of time. So like for example, if you like hard code it into the SPV client to say that if a block header, if, if two blocks are about three hours apart, and let's, fit, let's say we did some analysis on the Bitcoin blockchain as, and say the chance of that happening is minus zero, then you could say that the SPV client would raise a red alert and it would assume that it's been, assume that there's an eclipse attack going on. And so if you force them to do it within about three hours, um, so if, if blocks have to be within three hours apart, then the hardware, hardware cost would be about $91 million. Thanks.